Oh, this is Margaret in Windsor, and I was kidnapped in 1941 at age two and brought to Moulton, Alabama. I am going to put up the video I just uh, did and try to continue here. I uh, wanted to tell someone asked this, and I've put it up before, but I put up so many it's uh, hard to rifle through them all and find the one. I was talking about doing the book and living at Moonraker Apartments um, in Marietta, Georgia, 19. I moved from Treetop. I started doing the book in 76, and it was MD, a license to kill. It's about mind control and the use and the Tesla files, which, by the way, the History Channel is having a thing on the Tesla files, uh, a program there that, anyway, let me get to this and see if I can get it up on the second video. Um, I moved to Moonraker Apartments, uh, and from Treetop. Larry Flint was shot. I use that because he was shot there in Lawrenceville, Georgia. The Lawrence is used in a lot of these patterns of the, uh, killings that form a pattern because mind control is invisible. I was carried to, um, Lawrence County, Alabama, Moulton, Jeff K. and his father. His father was ambassador to England, put there by Roosevelt. The Illuminati took down my father, Edward VIII, who was married to an American school teacher, sister to artist Georgia O'Keeffe. My mom is Claudia Ruth O'Keeffe Windsor, which they have deleted my dad and replaced him with a double that married Wallace Simpson. Now, he was still a alive and he and my mom were still alive and married in to each other in um october of the 20th of 86 when i came to roanoke and that's for sure the double that married wallace uh was buried at windsor uh frogmore and he died in 72 so this whole thing is keeping going, the lies, the takedown of my father, which allowed the treaties to be uh, uh, illegal. They're illegal, but George the Sixth, illegal George the Sixth, Illuminati put in place and took my father down, kidnapped me, and I'm going to stop there. I'm going. So they're illegal, Elizabeth. They're war criminals, and they know it. They've had every chance to tell the truth, but the resurgence of the lies about my dad and this total double imposter marrying Wallace, uh, it's a smear job all over again. Uh, that's not my father and Elizabeth. They all know it. The, the whole family from get-go have known it. Now, I will get back to this if I can. Uh, Larry Flint was shot in Lawrenceville, Georgia. Lawrence is used uh, as one of the words in the patterns uh, that have been done. Um, as in Larry Flint or Lawrence Flint or Larry McDonald, the doctor I wrote about, and I ran in the campaign. Uh, and he even mentions that, that uh, Larry McDonald... was part of his shooting. Well, he's part of, uh, Larry McDonald was, of trying to kill me, too. Then the plane is taken down, with supposedly, with him on it. The KAL from uh, Alaska, Juneau, you know, sold South Korea. Now then, um, President Former President Nixon was taken off that flight, so they knew it was going down. There's questions as to uh, if... Larry McDonald was even on the plane and went down. But I got in that election, supposedly did special election. I didn't win it, but Mr. Flint, Flint helped me. Now then, Lawrence is used a lot throughout this, and Montgomery, Alabama's where the birth certificates are. That's the state capital. Montgomery is just part of the patterns. The Virginia Tech here, the Stack, one of the young students named Stack, was shot in... It shows how the precision, if you ever, if it's forced to be told, it shows the precision of how the shooter is programmed and how you get this bunch of people together with certain names that fit in it at a certain time. Just like the Grand Theater in Aurora, Colorado with James Holmes, who, this has nothing to do with mental illness. This is the sickest thing that no one has spoken out. And they hate me. They really do, first of all. Well, I'm not going to say that. I I was trying to uh, get this up, and I won't. 
Okay, I've gotten to where I did the book, and uh, Moonraker, and then A Licensed Kill was the name of it. Uh, a year later, maybe, well, I'm sure it was, Roger Moore come out with, he's a 007 associated with the Queen. He comes out with a uh, Moonraker, and it has a device in there that's kind of like a transmitter. It's associated kind of with what I'm talking about, mind control. Uh, anyway... Then later, even later than that, so I didn't get my, I didn't move into Moonraker and their fancy apartments. I've never lived in one before or since like it, but it was beautiful. I just had a hell of a time there trying to do the book and what happened, me and my sons. But anyway, I uh, I keep saying that I'm <laughs> tired uh, and old. Um, Timothy Dalton, uh came out right after the end of a uh, year later, I guess, after Moonraker was out. And after I'd been at, lived at Moonraker a few years prior, he was the 007, and he did a license to kill. Okay, I get the letter from the FBI June the 23rd of 79. June the 23rd is my father's birthday, King Edward VIII. So now then... <clears throat> I'm going to put this up here. Uh, my husband, I put it up before, but my husband, ex-husband, uh, I had a divorce from him that was supposed to, if anything he ever had, he was going to give me half of it because I don't know what he ever had, except he, um, except he um, was to leave me a life insurance policy. And it didn't matter if he remarried or I remarried it. It, this was the, uh, and it had an addendum to it, uh, making sure I was supposed to get it. It's so ludicrous because then, then the addendum is, is associated with my father who put an addendum to his forced abdication. He was taken down with character assassination by the Illuminati. Then they kidnapped me in 41. I was born in 39. And uh, let me get back to this if I can. I moved into Laurelwood from Moonraker, and that was May the 8th of 79, got the letter from the FBI, and I went up to the office and told um, the manager, and I took John, my husband or ex-husband, I thought at least I had the divorce. It wouldn't matter anyway. <laughs> uh, they're keeping, if there's a policy or anything he had down there, uh, it was supposed to have been mine when he died in uh, 90, March of 93 or 94, okay, in Atlanta. But back to this, I took him up to the office, and I know now this was all planned. Uh, she started telling me that her uncle was FBI agent in charge of the Patty Hearst. Well, I didn't know where Patty Hearst, because I didn't know about being kidnapping and the mafia or your global government being uh, the people that did it to me and took it down my father. In fact, they inserted their own monarch, George VI, illegal, and that's who Elizabeth represents. She's way up with the global government, which, which is your United Nation, your mafia, that you go to and beg to give you security. How's this? Think about it. Uh, that's what developed after they kidnapped me and took my dad down. Now then, I'm seeing if I've still got time. Um, I told her, and of course I look back now and I, it all makes sense. <laughs> um, I was running to the Atlanta Journal and my husband or ex-husband was going with me to the television station. I didn't know about being kidnapped and about, they, they certainly don't want to ever tell about my father and what they did to him and my mom, who's an American and all this. So everybody hates me. You wouldn't believe it. <laughs> I did nothing. I'm the victim. I was born. My father had integrity, told the truth, and and uh, everybody wants me shut up because it would the truth would really bother some people. <laughs> anyway, I um, see if I can get back to it. I told her, and John was with me, and I didn't know this was all planned or orchestrated. And I told her, well, he's coming back because of the things that happened. Uh, I was doing the book, and she said, oh, I paid. There was no involvement. I had the lease and paid the deposit and had been there when I took John up there. 
I'd been living in it for a month or two months. It was never, I just asked him, wanted to make sure it was okay if he came back sporadically and stayed because of um, what was happening to my sons and me. They were having the cars tampered with, sugar put in the lifters and all this, and scaring the heck out of me. Well, they were threatening my children to get through to me. So anyway, um, my security deposit, and it was okay for him to come in and, and stay. And here's one thing I want to insert, if I can get it in, is when I, this is just one of the uh, tactics that was used. When I came in, uh, Scott stayed in the downstairs, uh, which wasn't all that nice at all. It was kind of damp, I remember. And uh, Scott had that room down there. And when you'd walk down the steps, you'd step on these huge, I'm talking about spiders that are this big. And when I, and they were upstairs, and it scared the hell out of me. I went in one day, and John was standing there, and I looked, and John was sitting with Mark, my other son, on the sofa. And there was this huge spider right behind my son's head. I didn't know whether to scream, run at him to try to help him, or what. And I went up there and told her. And I know now they knew all this. Um, I went to pesticides, people that, well, I finally found somebody who told me what it was, the spider was. It was Sears. And uh, they sent somebody out, I believe, I know they did. And um, they told me that they weren't supposed to be there in this area. They were from South America, I believe is where he said. It's been a long time. But this is just part of the scare tactics. I mean, they were all over the house. It was like bombarding me. So then I'm going to skip to, um, you can't tell all the things that happened, but I thought my ex-husband, husband, I keep saying that, um, was helping me. And uh, it ended up that he kept saying, well, why don't you, I don't know why he was telling me to move, I do now, but he told me to go up, this is within the same apartment complex, um, he told me to go up and look at one that I might like better, well, I didn't, I went up there and I got sick, I come back down, and I didn't know why I'd gotten sick, but I told him I didn't want it, and it was, uh, period, I wasn't going to move up there, so there was never any uh, misunderstanding about any of this. So I'm going to fast forward to things got so bad that J John called his sister Laura Childers Klein. Okay, and she was um, a controller for, uh, in the oil business out there. Her and her husband later, they I'm going to give her a name because I, I don't know if she's still alive. He's dead, I believe. These people became a part in attempted murder. and By all means, I should have died with what they did to me. She lived in Abilene, and uh, John had called her and made it okay if, I, if things were so bad I was going to get a job, stay with her a couple of weeks and see if she could help me get a job, and if I did, I was going to uh, move the boys out there to get us away from all of it. I didn't know about being kidnapped till late 83, and... Um, I thought it was the book that, well, things had always been so, I, you know, I, I didn't know what to attribute the other things to. Anyway, it was okay for me to come out there, but I even called her before I left, and this is in uh, March, first of March, around the 8th of March. So I took what money I had in the car, and I went to, uh, got as far as, I can't remember the night, Mesquite. Is it Mesquite? Just outside Dallas. I got there, and I had been sleeping in the uh, stops there, uh, travel areas, because I didn't have money. And I got there and had money. I stayed at Days Inn, and my car got, somebody did something to my car in the night. And anyway, I called Laura that I didn't know about the car then. I hadn't found out. I called her, and I said, I'm here in Mesquite. Uh, Texas, and I'm uh, leaving, so I should be up there in a few hours. She said, don't bother. Uh, you can't come. You're not welcome now. Well, when I left, she told me to come. 
So I was shocked. I turned around and went back, and I'm going to make a long story short here. There's a lot that happened in between my getting there, and I I saw a, uh, I'm not going to say who, well, I've already said that. Uh, his name is Marshall Carnright. I didn't know he really was a U.S. Marshal till I, this is about three years later or two, two years later, yeah, that I was in the, back in Atlanta, and I stayed with him and his wife in their home out in Marietta. And I always thought, like everybody else did, he was just, um, that was his first name. It wasn't. Uh, he was, was a U.S. Marshal, and I saw it on his wall. That's how I found out, because I spent a few nights with him, because I was made homeless, and this is after they almost killed me. So I'm going to not there's too much to tell. It's like it's ongoing hell. And I'm not going to get this up. But um, I stopped by and saw him. Um, I still didn't. I thought he was just Marshall Conrad had a security agency. So when I got back, they had allowed, and I wasn't gone, but what? Uh, the, the couple of days that it took me to get out there and to come back, what, four days at the most? Uh, I came back, and my husband, they had allowed him, my ex-husband, uh, to me, he was my ex-husband. Later, I, it was told that the divorce wasn't finalized or something. It was on the 15th of, well, I'm not even going to say October. Uh, anyway, they pretty much done, it, done as they please, please with me. Uh, I got back, and they had allowed him in that few days to move from uh, my apartment from that part of Laurelwood to the part where he had sent me that I was so sick. And uh, the lease was in his name. The security deposit was used. And he signed a new lease, and they let him use, uh, move my apartment and everything. My son tried to tell me, Scott, when I came back, he said, Mom, I think you should know that Dad put you on his insurance policy. And uh, I, well, I was beginning to know that something was worse than worse by that time. I'm going to fast forward to a couple of weeks later, or a week later. It was so bad, things that were happening to me, and I'm trying to save my children, and <laughs> uh, I don't have a key. They didn't give me a key. They gave it to my to John, he had my apartment, my furniture, and my kids. They're his kids too, but they were given to me in the divorce. And here's the kicker: with money, alimony, and child support, which I didn't get. And when I tried to get it later, they tried to kill me again. <laughs> Him supposedly he remarried uh, right after they almost killed me in. April Fool Day of 80. This is mid-March. I go out to Texas to his sister. So they had it planned. Got me away, and she's a part of it. She has lived good. She's had a CPA firm in uh, Austin, Texas, and she lives, as far as I know, she's still alive, and she lives in the little town on Taylor's something road, uh, a nearby town. I can't think of the name of it right now. So no, none of these people have ever been prosecuted. Now this is going out. I'm going to fast forward to uh, the end of the month. I was in such a state, I went to someone I thought was a friend, Lois Pearson. She'd gone to uh, word processing school with me in July. The computers were just coming out and all that. I went there, and they put antifreeze in me. I didn't know what it was at the time. The next morning, I spent the night there. And I went to the emergency room, Dr. Chelton at 5th, uh, well, anyway, I'm, I'm going to get this up, was the emergency room doctor. He wasn't even supposed to be there. Dr. Beecham, who's still in practice in Atlanta, Victor Gonzalez, um, there was a bunch of doctors got into it. As far as I can tell, too, uh, Hardiman was in it. This is Piedmont Hospital, part of these work there. 